Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Africa Healthcare Network Fireside Chat Series 125. My name is Dr. Amar Swali, and I am a consultant, physician, and nephrologist working with Sri Hindu Mandala Hospital in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker for tonight, Dr. Homas Dastur, who currently serves at a nephrology consultant as a nephrology consultant at the Seha Kidney Center and Sheikh Shabut Medical City in Abu Dhabi, UAE. He finished his training in nephrology at the Columbia Presbyterian and Cornell Hospital in New York City, and his main interests include general nephrology, glomerulonephritis, electrolyte disorders, and sodium kinetics. He has previously had one talk with us about five months ago on understanding the basics of hyponatremia, and this is part two of the same talk. The first talk is uploaded on our YouTube channel, the Africa Healthcare Network Fireside Chats. Dr. Homas, thank you for taking time out for us once more to speak to us. And it's lovely to have you back again. Welcome. Mm, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I think it's a long uh, uh, presentation. And I will start today with a few cases I showed you last time because some people wanted a, a little more review on it. And I'll go from um, slightly what I call easier cases to slightly uh, tougher cases. But uh, just try and stay with me. If not, then obviously you will have the lecture on YouTube. So very important, I just want to emphasize once again, your urine volume is determined by two variables. Number one is the number of osmoles in the urine, which in turn depends upon the osmolarity of the food you eat. And and divided by the urine osmolarity, right? The urine osmolarity varies between minimum of 50 when there is no ADH to a maximum of 1200 when there is ADH. The osmoles in the urine are usually 600 to 900. Previously in the 50s and 60s, uh, when we were poorer as, as humankind, we used to eat around 600. Um, so the minimum urine that was defined as oliguria was 600 osmoles divided by the maximum urine osmolarity, which is 0 0.5 liters. Um, if you look in today's term, that definition would be wrong because now our diets are more rich in protein. So the, the amount of osmoles in the urine are around 900 divided by the maximum urine osmolarity. So so theoretically, the correct definition of oliguria today should be less than 650 ml and not 500 ml. At the same time, the maximum urine typically where you, you can produce without getting hyponatremic um, should be around 900 osmoles divided by the lowest urine osmolarity, which is around 18 liters. So, so basically what this tells me is that me as a normal person, um, if I can drink around 18 liters of fluid per day, I will not get hyponatremia. But as a normal person, if I drink more than 18 liters per day, then typically I will get hyponatremia. Okay, so that's very important to understand that urine volume is basically a function of these two variables. And if you have patients with hyponatremia, all you have to do is increase the urine volume and you can do it in two ways. Number one is to increase the osmoles that you excrete in the urine, or number two, by decreasing the urine osmolarity. Okay, so this slide once again shows um, the same thing um, you can see over here. Um, you can see that urine osmolarity, in case you don't have urine osmolarity, you can measure the specific gravity. Yes, specific gravity from a dipstick is much easier to get and much faster. So if you're in a rural hospital or in a hospital that doesn't have facility for urine osmolarity, just check the urine gravity. And it's a, it's a very, uh, it's like a straight line. 300 is equivalent to 1.01. 1.02 is 600. 1.03 is 900 and 1.04 is 1200. So urine specific gravity can indirectly tell you the urine osmolarity. And if you are a very, very rich hospital, urine osmolarity is direct, directly proportional to ADH levels, right? So if your ADH level is high, then your urine osmolarity should be high. If your ADH level is low or absent, then your urine osmolarity will be around 50, okay? 
Um, and the same thing, as I told you before, if you have a normal diet and you are excreting 900 osmols divided by um, the lowest urine osmolarity, which is 50, then potentially you can excrete 18 liters. But look what happens when you become sick, for instance, and you, your intake of um, uh, food or protein decreases. In that case, you can maybe excrete 450 or maybe even 300. Um, so this number will become nine liters or even six liters. So if you drink more than six liters, then you will become hyponatremic, okay? So typically that's what happens in, as I told you last time in older people, they go from 900 to maybe 300 osmols and the urine osmolarity because of pain and vomiting goes from 50, it can go up to 300. So the maximum urine they can excrete without getting hyponatremia would be 300 osmols divided by 300 osmolarity would be one liter only. So. Um, as soon as they drink more than one liter, automatically they become hyponatremic. And that's why you see in the hospitals, a lot of these old patients who are sick, they, they tend to have hyponatremia. This is an important formula just to understand. Yeah, the, um, uh, you don't have to memorize it, but total body sodium is a function of your plasma sodium multiplied by total body water. So if you have a 70 kilogram woman, with a plasma sodium of 140 uh, and total body water, which is 0.6 times 70, which is 42 liters, then her total sodium is 5,880 millimoles. At the same time, if you this person has a sodium level of 120, then the um, uh, total body sodium is 5,040. So uh, I'm just showing you this now because later on, it helps me in my clinical practice to figure out how changes in her treatment will ultimately determine the plasma sodium, okay? And this one I showed you last time, right? What is one gram of sodium? When you prescribe a patient one gram of sodium, what does that mean? And how is that different from one gram of sodium chloride? Sodium chloride is actually table salt, and this is what we are prescribing to our patients. And it is different from one gram of sodium because you cannot eat pure sodium. You're eating sodium chloride. But one gram of um, sodium is equal to 1,000 milligrams divided by the molecular weight of sodium, which is 23. That is, e that is equivalent to 43 millimoles. And one gram of sodium chloride is 1,000 milligrams divided by 23 plus 35. 35 is the molecular weight of chloride, that is 17 millimoles, okay? Now, let me show you a case which I showed you before. Um, so just to recap and refresh you. So I had a 65-year-old lady from Sudan and she presented with idiopathic peripheral edema. There, she didn't have any heart failure, liver failure, kidney function was normal. So that's why we just prescribed her two gram sodium diet and I wanted to check her compliance to her diet. So how do you figure out how much sodium this person is eating? So the only thing I had to do was to check her urine sodium, which came back as 224 millimoles per liter. Now, if she is excreting 224 millimoles per liter, I, I didn't check the urine volume. I just assumed that she is a normal person making two liters of urine. So the total sodium that she is excreting per day is 224 multiplied by two liters that comes to around 448 millimoles per day. Now, if I want to convert that into grams, I go back to that old formula. So which says that one gram of sodium is 43 millimoles. So I divide 448 divided by 43. That gives me 10.5 grams of sodium per day. So you can see she was prescribed two grams of sodium, but she was actually eating 10 grams of sodium per day. That explained her peripheral edema. And we confronted her and we explained to her our findings. And then she was prescribed a low salt diet and a short course of diuretics to get rid of the excess sodium. 
And after a few days, actually, she was fine. Okay. So this, this is a classic example where you can just measure the urine sodium and from the urine sodium, you can actually estimate a person's dietary sodium intake. Now, the second case is a case where I will, I will um, show you how mentally what goes through my mind when I see a patient with uh, hyponatremia. So we had a 54-year-old male who presented with headache and lethargy. So whenever I hear this, and if they call a nephrologist, I know it's not a neurologic problem. I know it's a nephrology problem. That's why they're calling me for headache, right? So the first thing that comes in my mind is, okay, you are calling me for hyponatremia, and it's obvious plasma sodium is 113. The plasma osmolarity is 232. So I know that it is a, it is a true hypotonic hyponatremia. The urine osmolarity is 580. So what that tells me is that there is an ADH effect. That does not mean that the person has SIADH. I'm kind of hesitant to label them as SIADH. I just say that there is an ADH-like effect. And the reason why I'm hesitant to say um, SIADH is because you should know that ADH is stimulated by two conditions. Number one, it is stimulated by hypovolemia, okay? And number two, it is stimulated in euvolemia, in which case it is considered as SIADH or ADH-like effect. So unless you clinically go and examine the patient, you can never make a diagnosis of SIADH. You have to go and examine the patient. And if he is hypovolemic, then this ADH is due to hypovolemia. But if the patient is euvolemic, then it is an abnormal excretion of ADH, which can either be due to drugs, due to malignancy, pain, pain nausea, vomiting, etc in which you, in case I say it's SIADH or an ADH-like effect. So because this patient was euvolemic and hypotonic, the definition, or sorry, the diagnosis was hypotonic, euvolemic, hyponatremia, which is an ADH or ADH-like effect. And I think last time I showed you the treatment, if somebody is not having seizures, I do not want to give them um, boluses. I prefer to slowly increase their plasma sodium over 24 hours. Yeah, So I give them what is called hypertonic saline. Um, hypertonic saline, as I told you, is one liter. One liter of 3% sodium chloride is basically 1,000 ml of water with 512 of sodium and 512 of uh, chloride. That basically means that two ml of this solution has one millimole of sodium. And the next step to remember that if your plasma sodium, the starting sodium is 113, and let's say I am targeting a sodium of 120 over the next 24 hours, then the sodium deficit, the amount of sodium that I need to give this person to increase the sodium from 113 to 120 is 0.6 times body weight into target minus current, that is 294 millimoles over 24 hours or 12 millimoles of sodium per hour. So in, in, in um, nephrology language, I would say that to increase this 70 kilogram person's sodium from 113 to 124 over the next 24 hours, I need to give him 12 millimoles of sodium per hour, which is the same as giving 12 times two, that is 24 millimole, milliliter per hour of 3% sodium chloride. So this is how I give a patient hypertonic 3% chloride, right? It's not, it's not like a, a randomly, I just say, give them 10 or 20. There is like a scientific formula behind this. Now, once you give these patients uh, 
uh, obviously you stop the offending agent and you bring them to a safe level. A safe level is usually about a 5% increase in the sodium. And then you have to give these patients uh, what, what I call the chronic treatment. If they have chronic hyponatremia, you have to give them chronic treatment, right? So number one, you can give them fluid restriction. Um, there is a formula. If your urine sodium plus potassium divided by plasma sodium is less than one, then you give them 1.5 liter fluid restriction. If it is more than one, you give them less than uh, one liter per day. And usually if your urine osmolarity is more than 500, which means you have an intense ADH-like action, usually these patients are not going to respond just to fluid restrictions. And then you have to look at other measures to increase the free volume excretion. And as I showed you before, you can increase the free volume excretion by increasing the osmols in the diet or by decreasing the urine osmolarity. Now, how do you increase the osmols in the diet? You have to give them something osmotic, right? So we can give them sodium chloride tablets. We can give them a high protein diet. SGLT2 inhibitors are now also being used because they get rid of glucose and sodium in the, in the urine. And in, in Europe, you also have urea, right? So what is interesting is that urea, about 30 grams of urea, has an osmolarity of 500. So if you put 500 in the numerator and your patient has a urine osmolarity of 500, then the urine volume potentially with um, 30 grams of urea is about one liter, okay? So that is kind of a standard dose of urea. You give them 30 grams of urea and you can increase the urine volume by about one liter per day. How do you decrease urine osmolarity? You can give them lithium. I've never used it. Uh, minocycline, I have used it, especially if the patients didn't have any peripheral edema or they, they looked to me to be slightly dry. I prefer to use minocycline. You can use furosemide, especially if the urine osmolarity is more than 500 or if they tend to have slight hypovolemia, that slight edema, that SIADH patients you see, you can use furosemide. And finally, if the patients uh, or you can afford it, you can use Vactans. The next, uh, I, will, I will skip this. It's a bit complicated. It will take a lot of time, but I'll show it to you later. Okay. Now, the third case, I'm not sure if I presented to you last time, but let's say I have a 30-year-old male patient who presented with brain trauma. Now, when you have brain trauma, there are two things that should come in your mind. The question is, does the patient have SIADH or does he have cerebral salt wasting? So this patient, 10 days after admission, had a plasma sodium of around 124 millimoles per liter, and the patient was non-communicative. And clinically, he was volume depleted. So the clinical examination is important. If the patient is volume depleted, uh, if the patient is volume depleted, then it's unlikely to be SIADH and more likely it is to be cerebral salt wasting syndrome. Okay. Now, why do I say cerebral salt wasting? Number one, you see the patient has a plasma sodium of 124. You see that he has a true hyponatremia because his plasma osmolarity is low. You see that his urine os osmolarity is 546. Um, the 546 means two things. There is ADH on board. Uh, now, ADH, as I told you, can be stimulated by volume depletion or if the patient is euvolemic. Now, because this patient is volume depleted, my, my diagnosis moved more towards cerebral salt wasting syndrome. And remember, when you are volume depleted, the kidney tries to conserve sodium. So if a person is volume depleted and the urine sodium is high, that goes more towards the picture of cerebral salt wasting syndrome. So looking at the fact that he is hyponatremic, he is volume depleted, 
despite volume depletion, his urine sodium is high, I can say that this patient has a salt wasting syndrome. There are two kinds of salt wasting syndrome. Number one, there is cerebral salt wasting syndrome and there is renal salt wasting syndrome. Because this patient has brain trauma, he fits the picture of cerebral salt wasting syndrome. Another clue is that patients with cerebral salt wasting syndrome typically have high urine volumes, whereas patients with SIADH typically have normal or kind of low urine volumes, okay? So for the next 48 hours, this patient was treated only with normal saline. And despite that, his plasma sodium went down to 118. Now this can happen, this is tricky. This can happen in both SIADH or in cerebral salt wasting. You know that in SIADH, when you give these patients normal saline, they will get rid of the sodium in the urine and the ADH will reabsorb water. So they get more severe hyponatremia. But it can also happen in uh, cerebral salt wasting. But nevertheless, let me show you how you treat my, my diagnosis once this happened and once I examined the patient, moved towards cerebral salt wasting. And I decided to treat this patient as a cerebral salt wasting syndrome. But in cerebral salt wasting syndrome, you have to do a few calculations. And let me go through that. Number one, the patient's plasma sodium is 118. His weight is 50 kilograms. So his total body water is 0.6 times his body weight, which is 30 liters. We are aiming to increase his plasma sodium from 118 to 125. So his sodium deficit is 0.6 times his body weight minus the target sodium minus current sodium, which is 210 millimoles. So if this was SIADH, I would give him 210 millimoles of sodium over 24 hours. But this is not SIADH. This is cerebral salt wasting. And the patient, this is just the deficit. You have to give the patient the ongoing sodium losses. The ongoing sodium losses, as I showed you, was 226 millimoles per liter times the three liters of urine that he is making. So the ongoing sodium losses are around 678 and the sodium deficit is around 210 millimoles. So the total amount of sodium that I have to give this patient over 24 hours is 678 millimoles plus 210 millimoles which is around 900 millimoles of sodium in three liters of fluid, which he is losing per day. Now, that was the reason why his sodium didn't go up. Because if you give this patient normal saline at 100 mLs per hour, you are only giving him around three liters of fluid and around 154 times three, that is around 450 millimoles of sodium you actually had to give this patient around 900 millimoles of sodium in three liters. So how do you give 900 millimoles in three liters? Okay. For me, it's very easy. What I do is I tell my pharmacist, make a specialized solution where you will take one liter of water and you will add 300 millimoles of sodium in one liter of water. So in, if I give this patient three liters, he will get a total of 900 millimoles of sodium in three liters, okay? And I run it at, uh, I think, whatever rate, maybe around 115 milliliters per hour. So if I give this patient three liters of this specialized solution, I will give him three liters of water and 900 millimoles of sodium, and this will correct his um, um, uh, cerebral salt wasting syndrome. You have to continue giving this same solution 
for the duration that patients have the cerebral salt wasting. Cerebral salt wasting usually starts around one week after their trauma and it lasts for around two weeks duration. So you may have to give for a period of two weeks this specialized solution. Now, if you don't know how to do this, one way, uh, another way to do it is very simple. You can give this patient two IV fluids at the same time. Number one, you can give them around three liters of normal saline, which is around 460 millimoles of sodium. And you can run another IV line where you give around one liter of 3% sodium chloride, which has 510 millimoles of sodium. So total, you are giving this person maybe around three to four liters of fluid, which has around 900 millimoles of sodium, right? But I think as a nephrologist, obviously you want to be smarter than your internist because a couple of times I see that uh, my internist is trying to compete with me in hyponatremia and they come up with this idea, but I give them a more, I would say more a nephrology kind of opinion for treatment of cerebral salt wasting. And I think this is more accurate as such, right? You give them one IV line, one specialized fluid, you give them the exact amount of fluid they need per day, and you give them the exact amount of sodium chloride you need per day. So that this is how you treat cerebral salt wasting. Now, this, this was a case I saw about two months ago, an unfortunate case of a 38-year-old patient who was bedbound, who had cerebral palsy. He was given desmopressin 60 micrograms uh, twice a day, which was double the dose. And the reason they doubled the dose was the patient kind of had breakthrough aneurysis um, for the cerebral palsy. So the mom um, decided to double the dose and uh, gave him uh, 60 micro, uh, micrograms. And just look at the course of this patient. Yeah, so this patient uh, obviously was getting a lot of um, um, uh, desmopressin, vasopressin, ADX, so he became hyponatremic. Um, and because um, he was uh, having a lot of ADX, his urine osmolarity was high. What when we were called, what we did was okay. The what is what what have we learned? Stop the offending agent. So DDAVP was held, and give him hypertonic saline. We gave him one point eight percent. I'm not fond of one point eight percent or two percent, but our hospital has a wrong policy to that we cannot give hypertonic saline in the wards. Uh, which is completely wrong and is proven wrong by literature, but we were forced to give the patient 1.8% hypertonic saline. And maybe in a way it was good uh, because look what happened, right? We stopped the DDAVP and we gave him hypertonic saline. So a rebound, a rapid increase in the plasma sodium happened here, okay? We didn't check the osmolarity, so ignore this part. But obviously, when you stop the DDAVP, the osmolarity should go down. So at night, my uh, junior doctor was called that, oh, uh, you have a rapid correction of hyponatremia, and the patient is at risk of osmotic demyelination. Um, if you have such a case, what you should do is bring them back down quickly. Yeah, it has been proven that even up to seven days, if you bring these patients back down quickly to more or less the normal levels, you reduce the risk of getting osmotic demyelination. So we attempted to reduce the sodium again by giving this patient D5 water and DDAVP. The D5 water will dilute the sodium and the DDAVP will help in retaining some of the free water and then the sodium came down again, yes? Uh, then again, we once the sodium came down, we decided that, okay, let's hold the DDAVP. And again, the sodium started coming up. And you can see that this time we decided to measure the urine osmolarity. When the DDAVP was present, the osmolarity was high. When the DDAVP was withheld, the plasma sodium started to go up again rapidly over here. And you can see the osmolarity started going down. 
and then we then we finally gave the the right treatment which was some hypotonic saline with ddavp on board and then we had a gradual and a slowly sustained increase in the plasma sodium concentration and the ddavp um, action increased the urine osmolarity so the learning point here is that whenever you have hyponatremia you should stop the offending agent but what we learned here is when you have a ddavp or vasopressin induced hyponatremia vasopressin is given usually for nocturnal nocturnal enuresis the recommendation is not to stop the offending agent the recommendation is to continue the offending agent or reduce the dose of the offending agent okay so this is one exception and this this process where you stop ddavp and you um, uh, you can see there is a reversal of urine osmolarity you go from a high urine osmolarity to a low urine osmolarity this process is known as reverse urine osmolarity whenever you see a reverse urine osmolarity these patients are at risk of rapid correction of their hyponatremia so it is recommended that whenever you see patients with hyponatremia follow the trend in the urine osmolarity and if you see that the trend in urine osmolarity you go from a high to a low urine osmolarity then you know that these patients will lo uh, will lose a lot of free water and they will get rapid correction of their hyponatremia and on top of that if you give them hypertonic saline the sodium will be pushed out in the urine and the sodium by osmotic diuresis will pull more water out so you will get an even more rapid correction yeah so this process is called reversed urine osmolarity it typically happens in ddavp induced hyponatremia the recommendation is do not stop ddavp give simultaneous hypertonic saline when correcting the hyponatremia and this is the same um, this was a case which i found in the literature a patient with symptomatic hyponatremia Uh, with seizures so obviously when you have seizures i would recommend giving boluses of 3% saline and here you can see the authors of this study also continued the ddavp if you did not continue the ddavp the urine osmolarity would drop you would get a reverse urine osmolarity and you would have a rapid increase in your sodium uh, level right more than the recommended so the recommended is not to increase maximum 8 to 10 milliequivalents per liter sodium in the first hour, five hours and also in the first 24 hours in the first two hours you can increase it rapidly by 5 millimoles per liter that's the recommendation in the first 24 hours but even in the within the first five hours you can increase it by 8 to 10 millimoles per hour and in the first 48 hours between 18 to 20 i would say is the safe um sodium here yeah? so this case is a rare case uh, um i had i had kind of never seen it before uh, i can say with confidence we treated it wrong but we learned from this and in the future when i get a similar case of ddavp induced enuresis i will not be stopping the ddavp now this is another case of uh, hyponatremia that i saw um recently but i've been seeing this over the last few years and i have some experience in this um and you will find a lot of this in the literature in the seminars of nephrology um there is case presentation and in american journal of kidney disease also uh, there are uh, cases of uh, hyponatremia with severe renal failure so this was recently i saw this case last year we had a young uh, patient from pakistan he came in with fluid overload and he he had a plasma sodium of 110 millimoles per liter he had a serum urea of 75 millimoles per liter if you want to convert it into uh, 
uh, milliequivalents, I think you multiply it by 2.8, which will be around 220, a creatine of 1,400, that means around 18 or 20 milligrams per deciliter, um, if you're using American units, and then uh, eight millimoles per liter, okay? So now my question to the audience is, how will you dialyze this patient? And how will you treat the hyponatremia? So for non-nephrologists, you are dealing with two problems over here. Number one, you have to dialyze the patient. You have to dialyze them against a dialysis fluid whose sodium is around 130. So obviously what, you, what happens is when you dialyze somebody against a dialysis fluid sodium of 130, there is a risk that their plasma sodium will also go up to 130. And as I told you, if you rapidly increase the plasma sodium, then you are at risk of getting osmotic demyelination syndrome. So uh, as a nephrologist, what is the dialysis prescription that you will give this patient so as to safely increase his plasma sodium from 110 to 115 millimoles per liter while dialyzing, dialyzing him with a, with a dialysis fluid sodium of 130 millimoles per liter, okay? So let's see what's happening here. First of all, you know that urea in this patient, the urea is 75 millimoles per liter, and in the brain cell, it is 75 millimoles per liter. Urea, as I told you before, is an ineffective or small. Urea does not make changes in fluids because urea equilibrates between the plasma and the brain. So whatever is the concentration in the, in the blood will be the same in the urea. So in this patient, the pre-dialysis urea is 75. Now let's see what happens if I was to dialyze this patient. If I was to dialyze this patient and reduce his urea to 40 from 75, now I have a condition where the patient's blood urea is 40, but his brain urea is 75, right? Now I told you it, it equilibrates, but it takes time. It takes, in animal studies like dogs, it has shown that it takes about four to five hours to equilibrate. And during this time, now urea, which was an ineffective or small, becomes an effective or small. So the urea is high in the brain and the brain will, will have osmosis of fluid, diffusion of fluid, and the brain will swell up, right? That's why I'm showing you the brain swell the brain cell is expanded. So it's kind of swollen up. Now, at the same time, there is another process which is happening during dialysis. You see the plasma sodium of this patient is 1110 and the brain cell sodium is 110. Now, when I would theoretically, if I dialyze this patient with a dialysis fluid sodium of 130, uh, over four hours, then his plasma sodium will become around 130 and his brain sodium would be 110. So fluid will move from the brain into the extracellular or the intravascular space and the brain cell will shrink and basically you will get osmotic demyelination syndrome. This syndrome where the brain swells is called dialysis disequilibrium syndrome. But if you put the two together, you can see that one process during dialysis increases the brain cell um, size and the other process decreases the brain cell size. So theoretically, these two processes cancel out each other and dialysis or even rapidly raising the plasma sodium in, the, in patients who have renal failure and hyponatremia is relatively safe, yeah? I put that in brackets because typically these two processes will cancel out each other and it is relatively safe, okay? But um, um, I have made an Excel sheet where if you look in the literature, there are different methods to predict the N-dialysis sodium. 
So if you put the numbers in, yeah, I, I, I will share with you the Excel sheet. It's just difficult to show it. I've just taken a screenshot. Yeah, if I use method number two, which I used to use until lately, I put in the patient's plasma sodium. I put in the patient's target sodium. I put in the rate. Then the, then the Excel sheet will automatically give me the total body water. It will calculate the sodium deficit. It will give me the dialysis fluid rate. It will The dialysis sodium is the minimum sodium of our dialysis machine, which is 129. So I don't change that. But what this formula tells me is that at a blood flow rate of 200 ml per minute, if you dialyze this patient for 60 minutes, the plasma sodium will increase from 110 to 117. And that is a safe value of plasma sodium for me. So I used to use this formula. This was until a few months ago where I was asked to review a literature from um, an article presented by an Egyptian doctor from Ain al Shams. And what he did was he made up a formula. Um, this is just basically for nephrologists where he said, which is true, we know that the molecular weight of sodium and urea is the same, 23 and 28. So if you can calculate the urea clearance, which is given by KT over V, uh, and you replace it with dialysis clearance, sodium clearance, that is KT over V, sorry, DNA T over V, where this is the same as um, K of urea, and you use this formula, um, at a certain level of dialysis clearance, that is at a certain level of KT over V, you can reach your target uh, dialysis uh, and end dialysis sodium. So what you have to do, basically, uh, I can share with you the article if you just email me. You just plug in your start dialysis sodium, which is 115, okay? you put in your end dialysis sodium that you want. You put in your dialysis fluid sodium and the machine will tell you that when, when your machine has an online clearance uh, module, if your machine has an online clearance module, the machine will tell you that when you reach a KT over V or a dialysis clearance of 0 0.31, then your sodium, your plasma sodium has reached a value of 119. So it, I, I've started using this formula and I put plug in the KT over V module into the dialysis machine. And I know that when I have reached a clearance of urea of 0 0.31, which is the same as the clearance of sodium, the patient's plasma sodium will have increased from 115 to 119. This formula is a bit complex uh, and you may not have that formula uh, module in your dialysis machine. I would recommend as an internist or I would recommend as a nephrologist to use method number two. I will also send you the Excel sheet where you can also use CRRT where all you have to do is dilute the fluid so if your dialysis sodium, if your initial sodium is 113 and you want to bring it up to 121, then you all you have to do is dilute the CRRT fluid to about 100 and to about two millimoles more than your target sodium, which is around 123. And you can reach uh, your target sodium over the next 24 hours. Yeah. But don't worry if you don't understand it. I will send you the formulas, everything, and you can you can practice it on your own. And here you can see uh, our labs. Yeah, this patient started with a sodium of one one ten. We dialyzed him, and these are not made up numbers. Yeah, please. This is a screenshot of the patient's actual from the patient's file. We reached a sodium of one one five. We reached a sodium of 118. Here, I'm not sure what happened. I think either we stopped dialysis for the, that day because we gave him three sessions. And then he reached a sodium of five. We were trying to increase in increments of five. So 115, 119 to 124, then 124 to 128, and then 128 to 132. 
So these formulas actually work. And if you have a patient with renal failure and hyponatremia, you can do slow, progressive dialysis every day to safely increase the plasma sodium from 1110 to 115. Yeah. So I think as nephrologists, you should know this. Now, let me go to case number six. Case number six is a 21-year-old male who was admitted with head trauma. And as I told you, if you have head trauma, two things come in your mind, either SIADH or cerebral salt wasting syndrome. Now let's go to how, how I, what went through my mind. Okay, plasma sodium is 123. So he has hyponatremia. Plasma osmolarity, okay, I didn't put it, but I can tell you it was low. He had true hypo, uh, hypotonic hyponatremia. His urine osmolarity was 580, so I know it is high. The first thing you should do is do a clinical assessment. If the patient was hypovolemic, then it is not SIADH. The patient may have hypovolemia. Either he is volume depleted from dehydration or he has cerebral salt wasting syndrome. But this patient with brain trauma was euvolemic, so I know that it is not cerebral salt wasting syndrome, okay? Also, his urine sodium is normal, okay? So it is not very high. So that kind of rules out cerebral salt wasting syndrome. So putting the whole picture together, a patient with low plasma sodium, clinically euvolemic, ADH-like effect on board, my diagnosis would probably be SIADH. But the question for you guys is, what is the diagnosis? What kind of fluid will you use? And once you have corrected the SIADH, how much protein, salt, diuretics, the measures that you use to correct hyponatremia, how, how much will you prescribe? And what is the effect of all of these on the patient's plasma sodium, right? Because now you're a nephrologist, right? You cannot just say, oh, put the patient on high protein diet and high salt diet. As a nephrologist, you have to give the correct order, how much protein you want to give this patient, how much salt tablet you want to give. Because for me, that is what distinguishes me as a nephrologist from an internist. So here you can see that we diagnosed this patient as SIADH, which was appropriate. And again, on the floor, we, we gave this patient 1.8% sodium chloride. And look what happened. He went from 122 to 126. We were very happy for one day. And the next day, it went down to 122. Then we changed the fluid. We gave him 2% sodium chloride and then it gradually went up. But the question which came to my mind and my junior asked me was why that even when he, we gave this person 1.8%, which is hypertonic to normal saline, why did his sodium go up and down? So it took me a few minutes and then I figured it out. You know that 1.8% has an osmolarity, sodium of around um, 308 milli, uh, millimoles and uh, around 308 of uh, chloride. So it has a total osmolarity of around 616, whereas 3% has 512 of sodium and 512 of chloride. So it has an osmolarity of 1024 and 2% sodium chloride has an osmolarity of 684. As a general rule, when you are giving hypertonic saline for SIADH, you should give them fluid which has an osmolarity of about 100 millimoles more than the urine osmolarity. If you give them a fluid which has an osmolarity similar to their, to their urine osmolarity, that will not correct their hyponatremia, okay? And this is what happened in this patient. We gave him an, um, a fluid which had an osmolarity, which was similar to his urine osmolarity. And that is why his hyponatremia initially corrected, but went back down to normal. Yeah, because then you, you are retaining the water. You have to give them fluid, which is more hypertonic 
to the urine osmolarity, which will push water out by an osmotic diuresis. Okay, so please remember that. Always give a fluid whose osmolarity is higher than the patient's urine osmolarity. Now, my, my, my question to you is, what is the effect? Now that you corrected it and you stopped the hypertonic fluid, how, how much protein, salt, and diuretics will you give this patient? So let's look at the effect of all three, okay? It's a little, a little bit of calculation, but if you understand it, you will be at what I would call genius level of nephrology, yes? Um, so uh, I hope you can understand all of this, yeah? So here we have a patient with a plasma sodium of 123. The urine osmolarity is 580. The total body water is 0.6 times body weight, which is 36 liter. And the total body sodium is the plasma sodium multiplied by total body water, which is 4428. Okay. So now you know that this patient's osmolarity is 580. Okay. And you know that whatever changes I make, he will pass a certain amount of urine. So urine volume is urine osmols divided by urine osmolarity. And the patient's new, new plasma sodium will be total body sodium divided by the new total body water. And that will give you the plasma sodium. Okay. Now let's see what happens when I give this patient high protein diet. Now I know I checked the labeling of the sausages. I told you last time. In uh, Abu Dhabi, I like uh, in the Al Islamia sausages because they have like a smoky flavor and they're beef sausages. So each gram of sausage has 5.7 millimoles of urea. So if I give this patient four sausages, I, I, I saw the jumbo beef sausage, each sausage weighs about 10 grams. So if I give this patient four sausages, which is 40 grams, so that is equivalent to giving this patient 228 milliosmoles of osmolarity. Now, this 228 milliosmoles um, uh, will, in a patient with a urine osmolarity of 580, will excrete, will cause a forced diuresis of 0 0.4 liters. So these osmoles will come out in the urine and will have no effect on the sodium level in the body. They just come out in the urine, but they push with it around 0 0.4 liters of water. So now your patient's total body water, which was 36 liters will now be 36 minus 0 0.4. So his new total body water will be 35.6. His total body sodium will be the same as before because we have not caused any change in his total body sodium. So his new plasma sodium will be a total body sodium divided by total body water, which is 124.3. In other words, giving this patient four sausages will induce a certain amount of diuresis, which will decrease his total body water and raise his plasma sodium from 123 to 124.3. Now, if I give them salt tablets, right? I calculated salt tablets. Each salt tablet in my hospital, 600 milligrams, has 10 millimoles of sodium and 10 millimoles of chloride. So if I give them um, four tablets three times a day, I am giving them 120 sodium, 120 chloride, which is around 240 milli os uh, millimoles, which at the same urine osmolarity will also cause around 0 0.4 liters of fluid loss and sodium will uh, increase from 123 to 124.3, okay? Now look what happens when I give them salt with a diuretic. So I gave them the same amount of salt but with a diuretic, the urine osmolarity decreased from 580 to 300. So the free water excretion now is not 0 0.4. It is 240 osmoles of sodium chloride divided by the urine osmolarity of 300, which means he will put out 0 0.8 liters of free water. 
So now his plasma sodium is 4428 divided by 35.2. So there is a more effective increase in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, the in plasma sodium. Now you will ask me, well, why did this plasma sodium not increase? Remember, you are dealing with SIADH. In SIADH, there is no abnormality in sodium excretion. Whatever sodium you put in, it will come out. So the total body sodium was 4428. And at the end of sodium chloride tablets and urea, it will still be 4428. Yeah, there is no change in the total body sodium. There is only a change in the total body water, which was caused by the sodium or urea that you give, and he will spill out in the urine. SIADH is not a disease of sodium. It is a disease of water. You are retaining water and you have to excrete that water by giving an osmotic load or by decreasing a urine osmolarity. And then finally, Let's look at what will happen if I give this patient all three. I give them a salt, I give them a diuretic, and I give them a protein. So salt and protein will add 228 plus 240. That is 468 osmols to his urine. His, the diuretic will reduce his urine osmolarity. So the free water excretion per day will be about 1.5 liters. So his new plasma sodium will be 4428 divided by 34.5, that is 128. So his plasma sodium will go from 123 millimoles to 128 millimoles. So if you look at all of this, you can see that the most effective way to increase somebody's plasma sodium in a clinical setting, not in an inpatient setting, where you want to increase their plasma sodium is to give them a combination of salt, protein, and a diuretic. So that will be the most effective way. In older people, I usually start with salt tablets. I tell them, come back in two weeks. If it is still high, or if it is still low, I add a diuretic. Uh, if it is still uh, low, then I tell them, okay, start eating some sausages a day. Now, um, I would say I have two more cases, but um, it will take a long time. Let's do only one case, yeah? Uh, and this case is just to stimulate your thinking, right? What is, what is the definition of hyponatremia? So hyponatremia, if you look at up-to-date and the American literature, it says that ADH... Uh, less than one uh, urine osmolarity less than 100. This is an ADH independent hyponatremia. So this can happen in beer portomania, primary polydipsia, etc. If your urine osmolarity is more than 100, then by definition they assume the American nephrologists assume that you have ADH on board. Uh, the ADH can be stimulated by volume loss, as I told you before, cerebral salt wasting, renal salt wasting. It can be under euvolemic conditions where you have ADH-like effects because of nausea, pain, medication, cancer, or you have a pure SIADH, okay? And these are euvolemic conditions. In hypervolemic conditions, the urine osmolarity is also high and ADH is stimulated, but for a different reason. This is a low flow state, yeah? Your pump is not working properly in CHF. So the macula densa has a low flow of sodium and chloride. The kidney is falsely thinking that the low sodium chloride represents a low volume state, and it secretes renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, and ADH. And that is why your urine osmolarity is high. Now, the Europeans, on the other hand, say that, hey, if you, if you think that just because somebody's urine osmolarity is high and you start labeling all these euvolemic patients as SIADH, you may actually be over-diagnosing SIADH. And the European best practice guidelines are actually saying that 
um, just because somebody's urine osmolarity is more than 100, yes, they may have ADH, but they may also not have ADH, okay? Um, there may be other, other conditions where your urine osmolarity may be more than 100, but you can have a non-ADH related increase in urine osmolarity, yeah? Uh, and, and that's difficult to understand, so I made this for you, okay? And, and the Europeans define this as what is called a gray zone. So let's, let's look at it more closely. In the American classification, if your urine osmolarity is less than 100, then they define it as an ADH-free zone where you do not have SIADH. If your urine osmolarity is more than 100, then they define it as an ADH zone where most likely if you are euvolemic, you have SIADH. The Europeans are saying that yes, same is true over here, if your urine osmolarity is less than 100, you are in the clear zone. But the Europeans are saying a definite, a definite ADH zone is one in which your urine osmolarity is greater than your plasma osmolarity. So if your sodium is 120 and your plasma osmolarity is 257 and your urine osmolarity is more than 257, then the Europeans are saying that this is a, this, you can guarantee that this is an ADH zone. So what is, what is, what happens when you get urine osmolarity between 100 and 257? The Europeans are saying that this is defined as a gray zone where number one, yes, your diagnosis is just like here. It is SIADH, but if you have a patient in this group, Try and think about other diagnoses as well. Okay, what, what are the other diagnoses besides SIADH and ADH-like effect? The other diagnosis, sorry, sorry, um, can be something called syndrome of hyper-responsiveness to ADH. It can be reset osmostat or, or some other diagnosis, yeah? Uh, like, uh, I have I have defined this. I have changed the classification. I'm sorry, you won't find this anywhere. This is what I have made and I would like to publish. Um, but we define this as something called the gray zone. And yes, in the gray zone, number one would be SIADH, but you have to think about reset osmostat, something called RWP, which I won't be able to present today. Think about thiazide-induced hyponatremia, think about exercise-induced hyponatremia, or think about a syndrome called hyper-responsiveness to ADH. Let me show you a case. This is my last case, okay? So this is a 70-year-old female who presented with fatigue, weakness, and poor appetite, euvolemic, plasma sodium 122, plasma osmolarity 251, urine osmolarity is more than 100, closed, shut case, right? You open up to date, you see this patient, euvolemic, hypotonic, hyponatremia, the patient's urine osmolarity is more than 100, boom. You are in this zone, this patient has ADH, treatment, fluid restriction, symptomatic, give them 3% saline, hypertonic saline, whatever. Right. So this patient, um, it was not seen by me, but uh, initially was given 0.9% sodium chloride. And just as expected, we had diagnosed her with SIADH. So I expected that after the internist gave sodium chloride, the, the sodium would go down and this reinforced the diagnosis of SIADH. But I decided based upon what because I had recently read the European guidelines, I said, okay, um, maybe this patient's urine osmolarity is not greater than the plasma osmolarity. And the Europeans are telling me that uh, this patient is in the gray zone where they may not have ADH secretion. So I actually decided to send the ADH level. So in our hospital, we can send the ADH level to France and uh, I decided to send it. 
And I said to myself, if the, your, if the American guidelines are correct, then this patient should have circulating ADH levels. But if the Europeans are correct, uh, then maybe this patient may have circulating ADH level, or she may be in the gray zone where she does not have ADH level, and maybe she has an alternative diagnosis. So nevertheless, the patient became symptomatic. We gave her 3% saline. We raised her plasma sodium to 125. She was put on fluid restriction and minocycline, and her plasma sodium increased, and she was discharged home with a diagnosis of SIADH because her urine osmolarity was 100, more than 100, okay? Two weeks later, the patient returned to me and our pathologist, Dr. Haidar, got the ADH levels and the ADH levels were totally absent or were negligible. So when this patient's urine osmolarity was more than 100, I would have expected based on the American guidelines that ADH is circulating in the body and that's why the urine osmolarity should be more than 100. But surprise, surprise, the ADH level actually fit what the European best, guess, best practice guidelines, nearly absent or negligible. Uh, and this patient belongs in the gray zone. And what was the diagnosis? For sure, this patient does not have SIADH. But I think what this patient had is something called X-linked hypersensitivity to ADH or an inability to reduce the urine osmolarity with age. Old people, they may suppress their ADH, but they have a tubular problem where they cannot reduce the urine osmolarity independent of ADH. But the treatment is the same, which is fluid restriction and... Uh, uh, and keep the plasma sodium more than 130, okay? So once again, this is what happened. If you follow the American guidelines, you will define, you will, you will uh, diagnose this patient as ADH, but if you follow the European guidelines, where try and remember, yes, if your osmolarity is more than 100, you have ADH on board, more specifically, if your urine osmolarity is greater than the plasma osmolarity, you are 100% sure that there is ADH on board. But if your urine osmolarity uh, is between 100 and less than the plasma osmolarity, you fall in the gray zone where your number one diagnosis is still SIADH, but you have to keep in mind other diagnoses like thiazide-induced um, hyponatremia, exercise-induced hyponatremia, inability to reduce urine osmolarity with old age, or X-linked hyperresponsiveness syndrome, where you have very little or absent ADH, but that little ADH is able to increase the osmolarity a little to reabsorb water and cause these old patients to have hyponatremia, okay? The treatment is going to be the same anyway. So, but as a nephrologist, it's important to know what, what am I dealing with, yeah? So what is the hyper-responsiveness theory? So I found one or two cases, and let me just read over it, yeah? So some studies have shown that about 5 to 10% of the patients who you label as SIADH actually have low or undetectable levels of ADH in the blood. So this is exactly what was happening in my patient. I had labeled her as SIADH, but when I checked her ADH level, it was either low or nearly absent, okay? It is possible that this low, uh, that ADH is not present or is present in a very small detectable level, but it has some biological effect on the tubule to increase the um, urine osmolarity. And this is true, especially in females, in older females who with age will have a gain of function mutation in the vasopressin receptors where they have low normal or extremely low circulating levels of ADH, which will give them an exaggerated response to ADH. And this is called the hyper-responsiveness theory. 
So basically, uh, uh, I think you cannot diagnose this without actually doing ADH levels. And if your hospital does not have the facility to do ADH, you will not be able to respond uh, to diagnose hyper responsiveness. But for academic purposes, it's it's good to keep in mind about this syndrome. Yeah. So I'll stop over here because to present the last case may take me more than an hour. But once again, uh, try and think about this alternative diagnosis of hyponatremia if you want to be really more academic. And then if you have any questions or if you want these slides, you can email me or better just WhatsApp me and I will send you these slides. Uh, and I will also send you the Excel sheet where you can uh, play around with the sheet of how to um, uh, treat hyponatremia with renal failure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dastur. That was such an insightful presentation. And we actually now have a reason to bring you for part three of this talk. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, this is going to be very soon. So uh, for the panelists, please feel free to unmute yourself if you have a comment or question for Dr. Dastur. And for the attendees, please use the chat boxes uh, to post your question. I see there's a question here already. And uh, if any of the attendees would like to ask this question live, we can allow you to talk if you request for it, if you raise your hand. So I would like to open the floor for comments. Thank you, Dr. Dastur. Oh, I can say quite an informative uh, presentation and also quite insightful. I also want to echo what uh, Dr. Amara said. I think we need to get you for another third session to come in. I think on my side, in terms of the take home message, uh, in a clinical setting, like you said, for a patient with uh, hyponatremia, especially the euvolemic, I think uh, take home is to give salt, protein, and a diuretic. But uh, now, when it comes to the question, if you have a patient with uh, uh, euvolemic hyponatremia, uh, does the chronicity also matter? Like, uh, for example, if it's a patient with uh, acute symptomatic hyponatremia versus chronic. Yes, yes, it makes a difference. And I think I showed you last time. It's hyponatremia is a very long topic. You can, I can talk for five hours, and I can't present it everything. But I, I showed you last time. If you have an acute hyponatremia, you can correct acute hyponatremia much more quicker. And acute hyponatremia is usually more severe. These patients are symptomatic. And my suggestion is depending upon the severity of their symptoms, if they are presenting with, let's say, with seizures or something after running a marathon, then I would give them boluses of 3% sodium chloride, one bolus, two or three boluses until their seizures or their symptoms have resolved, okay? And acute hyponatremia is much safer to treat quickly than chronic hyponatremia because in acute hyponatremia, the brain swelling is still not happened completely and the, and the adaptive change, sorry, the adaptive changes haven't happened quickly. Whereas in chronic hyponatremia, the adaptive changes have happened after the acute swelling, the cells have shrunk and if you correct it quickly, then the cells will shrink even more uh, severely, and then you get the osmotic demyelination syndrome. In acute hyponatremia, the cells have, have expanded in size, you correct it quickly, and they go back to normal size. So there is a difference between acute and chronic hyponatremia. Okay, thank you for that. That answers my question. Okay, can I go to the question which is in the chat by Mr. Jackson, uh, yeah. Dr. Jackson Agutu, and he asked me, how can you be used sodium chloride with sodium of 154 millimoles to correct hyponatremia? Actually, uh, you cannot, you cannot correct, um, 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 you can only correct hyponatremia if it is volume related. So if you have somebody with hypotonic hyponatremia, common sense, just give them saline because these patients are volume depleted. On the other hand, if you have somebody with SIADH, you can never give them normal saline because normal saline, what happens is the one liter of water that you give them, a large chunk of that water will be reabsorbed because of the ADH. 
and the amount of sodium and chloride in the urine which will come out. So 154 of sodium and 154 of chloride, which has an osmolarity of 300, will induce a certain amount of osmotic diuresis, but the free water, the one liter of free water, which is retained, will be higher than the amount of water that is that is uh, um, excreted by the osmotic diuresis. So let's say out of the one liter of water, the 154 of sodium may produce 300 ml of diuresis, but the remaining 700 ml, because of the effect of ADH, will be reabsorbed and actually your sodium will go down. So that is why you can never give normal saline to a patient with 3%. Sometimes, if you are confused, does the patient have SIADH or not, I actually give them normal saline. And if their sodium goes down, that is kind of like a diagnostic test that this patient has SIADH. Um, so I hope that answers your question. You have to give them hypertonic saline to treat SIADH and more specifically hypertonic saline, whose osmolarity is more than the patient's urine osmolarity. And that is why I usually give them 3% because 3% has an osmolarity of 1024, which is usually more than the patient's urine osmolarity. Urine osmolarity, the highest I have seen is around 750 or 800. So giving them 3% will always increase the plasma sodium. So I hope um, that answers your question, uh, Dr. Abutu. Um, there is another question. What's your thought on sodium profiling during dialysis? See, sodium profiling is the same, right? So sodium profiling means you are increasing the sodium. Uh, our dialysis machines are limited by the fact that we can only reduce the sodium uh, from 135 or 140 to a lowest of 130, right? So your diffusion gap will be from the patient's plasma sodium of 110 to the lowest dialysis sodium, which is 30, uh, 130. So the gap is around 20 millimoles per liter. So what your aim here is now is not to give an efficient dialysis your aim is to reduce the flux of sodium uh, from the dialysis fluid to the plasma fluid to such an amount of plasma sodium, which will increase the patient's plasma sodium from 110 to 115. And this is limited by the time of dialysis, right? Your urea uh, clearance in, in dialysis depends upon the blood flow rate and the time. And the same way, um, sodium flux depends upon the blood flow rate and the time. So the only way you can control your sodium flux, that is the flow of sodium from dialysis uh, to the plasma, is by reducing the blood flow rate and by reducing the time on dialysis. So typically, a low sodium, um, uh, if you're using a dialysis sodium of um, um, around 130, if you give this patients a short session of around 90 minutes or 120 minutes with a dialysis blood flow rate of around 150 to 180, then you can be sure that the plasma sodium will increase around five millimoles per liter in case you don't want to use the formula. So you can use this rough calculation a slow dialysis blood flow rate of 150 to 180 for a duration of one, uh, uh, 90 minutes or 120 minutes using a low flux, low efficiency dialyzer will theoretically increase your plasma sodium from 1110 to 115 or around five millimoles per liter. So I hope that also answers your question, uh, Dr. Akrabi. Uh, Dr. Aluchi Nawabiab uh, had a question. Thank you for your presentation. What do we do when we don't have hypertonic saline? Then uh, I, I suggest if you don't have hypertonic saline, try and make your own saline. Maybe 
maybe your pharmacist has vials of sodium chloride. Sometimes you can get 23.5% sodium chloride and you need to find out, like in my case, if when I wanted to give this patient 300 millimoles of sodium, ask your pharmacist how much, uh, how much of this, uh, how many milliliters of this 23.5% vial has 300 millimoles of sodium. So if he tells you, okay, one, milli, one milliliter out of five ml vial has 300 millimoles. So you take this one milliliter of 23.5% sodium chloride vial and you mix it in one liter of free water and that will give you a uh, hypertonic saline, uh, which has 300 millimoles of sodium in one liter. Or if you want to make 3% saline, you ask your pharmacist how much of 23% sodium chloride has 512 millimoles of sodium. And he comes back and tells you approximately 1.8 ml. So you draw 1.8 ml of 23.5% sodium chloride. Uh, which has 512 of sodium and you mix it in one liter of free water. And that is the same as making your own 3% hypertonic saline. In case you cannot do that, then unfortunately you have to go by non-fluid methods, um, which is giving, um, giving them um, you know, fluid restriction. Now, somebody told me, and I haven't used it before, somebody told me, that you can use sodium bicarb, especially when instead of giving sodium chloride infusion, use sodium bicarb infusion because 50 ml of or 100 ml of sodium bicarb solution is having 100 ml of sodium. So remember when you want to give that marathon runner who is, who is having a seizure, 100 ml of uh, uh, whatever, 50 ml of 3% sodium chloride, which also has about, uh, I think about 50 or 100 ml of sodium. If you don't have that um, syringes of 3% uh, sodium chloride, you can probably push them 3%, uh, sorry, the, the sodium bicarb uh, um, syringe, and that, that'll also increase your uh, sodium level. I have never tried it. It was suggested to me and it makes a lot of sense. And I think they may be right. So I hope that answers your question as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Astun. That was really a very enlightening uh, uh, talk on hyponatremia. Thank I don't you. think I've had anyone <laughs> present it so much. So, okay, as a pediatrician, you know, I, I see a lot of patients with hyponatremia who um, are new needs, right? I know this is not your field, right? Mm. But the problem is when you look at free sodium excretion in your needs, it's very different from what you see in the adult population because they are salt losers, okay? And uh, neonatologists are always correcting the hyponatremia um, by saying that, uh, okay, we can tolerate a certain level, but we need to bring it up to normal. However, if you look at normally, these neonates are always running at a level of about 130 to about 135. Mm. Now, the, the question I always ask myself is, how tolerant are these patients if you have this chronic hyponatremia? I mean, I, I personally don't think, and I don't have any literature to it, in fact, that it's going to cause any major problem because you know they are losing it physiologically in the urine. You know what I mean? They are salt losers. What's your take on it? Um, I have, the, <laughs> as you said, I have no clue about okay. neonates. <laughs> okay. I don't have any clue about the brain size because they have the fontanelles. I, I know yeah. the brain probably can tolerate more degree of brain expansion. Yes. Uh, but I don't know how the opposite would happen where you correct it rapidly or, or severely. So the brain shrinks. I have no idea. What I can just tell you is from adults, if somebody has chronic hyponatremia, yeah. I am not very aggressive in treating their hyponatremia. I try to bring them up uh, very uh, slowly, you know. Um, that's all I can tell you, you know. Uh, unless they are very, very symptomatic with their chronic hyponatremia, then I may think about giving them uh, hypertonic saline 
to bring it up only by four to five millimoles per liter. Um, and, and, and bringing it up by four to five millimoles is more than enough uh, at a safe level, especially for chronic hyponatremia. For acute hyponatremias, you can go up to eight or even 10 uh, millimoles per level. But for chronic, I wouldn't go up more than four to five millimoles. But to, uh, unfortunately, I cannot give you an answer yeah, yeah. for units, and I don't yeah. want to give you a wrong answer <laughs> on the forum because it will be published on YouTube and I can see all those comments coming up, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so no, it's always a challenge, that, that challenge that, I, uh, that I face in the unit yeah. because, you know, my take on it is that this is in, in the newborns almost like a physiological process. You know what I mean? Yes. And mm -hmm. if they are not symptomatic or anything, I mean, you yeah. can just tolerate I would, it. I would think the same would apply unless I don't know something about uh, neonates, physiologies or something, you know. So that would be the only contraindication from deviating yeah. from adult management, mm -hmm. you know. Um, uh, otherwise, I would assume probably it would be the yeah. same. But I have absolutely zero experience in neonates and children, so I wouldn't tell you the right answer, you know. Oh, thanks. Okay. I'm sorry about that. No, 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 that's fine. I mean, I don't expect you to answer something that's out of your field. I was just wondering that whether hyponatremia in, you know, in that setting be yeah. any different, but it's a, it's, it's like I, like you said, you know, it's yeah. a chronic hyponatremia that they are sitting with, especially yeah. in this uh, preterms where SGAs, etc. and you know, if, yes. What we shouldn't do, uh, which rightfully you said, is to too rapidly correct it because it's yeah. chronic. See? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bhima. If uh, Dr. Dastu, you could take one last one from the chat box. Uh, yeah, sure. It's on, uh, your take on the fluid choice and uh, approach in beer portomania with profound uh, symptomatic hyponatremia. See, in, um, in, in beer portomania, there is a different pathophysiology. Remember, I showed you urine volume is osmols in the diet or urine divided by urine osmolarity. These patients, unless they have like a medullary washout, the assumption is that the urine osmolarity is, is normal. So let's say it's around three, uh, let's say it's around 300, okay? Uh, but in beer portomania or or also in malnutrition, which is kind of similar to beer portomania, these patients are not eating a lot of protein. They are only eating carbs and carbs don't have an osmolarity. So instead of having uh, the osmols in the urine around 900, um, now the osmols in the urine can go down to even 300. Okay, so the urine volume, which is 300 divided by the osmolarity, which is 300, is only one liter, which means that typically beyond one, if they drink more than one liter of fluid, potentially they can become hyponatremic. So the only way to treat these beer portomania patients, obviously, if they are symptomatic, you give them 3% saline. But if they are asymptomatic and they just have hyponatremia, the only way you can treat them appropriately is to increase the free water excretion, which means by increasing the numerator, which is the osmols in their diet, uh, in turn, the osmols in the urine. That means you suggest to them uh, be on a high protein diet, improve your nutrition, give them sodium chloride tablets, give them urea, etc. Uh, all those things which I showed you, which will increase the numerator, that means the osmols in the urine, and increase the free water excretion. So that is the only way to uh, treat beer um, portomania. Uh, once again, if acute, symptomatic, give them hypertonic saline. If they present with chronic hyponatremia, use measures which will increase the urine osmolarity and if they, uh, sorry, the osmols in the urine so that they excrete more free water. And if the urine osmolarity is high for whatever reason, try and reduce it by giving them minocycline or even furosemide. So in that way, you can increase the free water excretion and the plasma sodium comes up gradually. Thank you very much, Dr. Dastur. I am personally looking forward to uh, the last case uh, that you wanted to present, but you said would take... Yeah, the uh, last case would take about half an hour. It's very interesting. Maybe we can do a session sometime 
and I can present it. And in the meantime, if probably if I've collected some other interesting case, then the other 15, 20 minutes, I could add another second case of hyponatremia. Uh, but the last case is something that has not been published in the literature. Um, and I'm trying to publish it with my colleague, but I just haven't had time or the mental effort. And maybe if I can present it, and if somebody from uh, your society wants to help us, we can present, uh, we can publish it together. But uh, that'll be next time. That would be lovely. Thank you so much. So before I hand over to Dr. Lloyd for the vote of thanks, uh, uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Dostur, on behalf of the Africa Healthcare Network yeah. uh, for tonight's uh, lovely talk. Uh, we will have this video up uh, hopefully by Monday in the coming week. Uh, for uh, attendees uh, claiming... Can I, sorry, uh, can I just interrupt? I just wanted to say that uh, if any any of the participants, if you have any interesting case or you need some advice, please free feel free to contact me because I'm always looking for interesting cases in hyponatremia and collecting them. And anytime you can WhatsApp me or email me. So I'm open to any kind of uh, free consultation, collaboration, anything. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sure people will reach out, especially that you've given your, your WhatsApp number and your email address down there. So for attendees claiming CPD points in Kenya and Tanzania, please find the link uh, posted by Dr. David on the on the chat box. Dr. Lloyd, uh, for the closing remarks, please welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is a phenomenal uh, effort, uh, Dr. Dastu. This is really, really you know, out of the, you know, out uh, out and out, uh, so much pipe on it, and, and and it's really unbeatable. Uh, no wonder, like, and I, I see, uh, you know, the output uh, from your first video that it's taken such a lot of people, I mean, and so many people we really have on board there. And I think this this will go up on YouTube, and it's really uh, enjoyable uh, going through this. And it, actually, one needs to really sit through the YouTube video now to you know go through it in detail. So thank you so very much. It's such You're a welcome. wonderful. And, and we want the third session too. Don't forget the third session. We the third session is tomorrow. very, very complex, but uh, I want to present it to you because I know that um, um, the majority of you, once I present it, you will understand more concepts in hyponatremia, something which is very advanced, but yeah. I'm sure you guys will get it and hopefully it will improve your practice and understanding of hyponatremia. Thank you. Thank you so very much. This is a wonderful session.